we'll, we'll crack on. <laughs> uh, so yeah, recording's own progress, so we can start. So um, we're here this morning to discuss how we can find energy savings in our community buildings. Um, I will run through who I am and who is uh, supporting us a bit later on, but um, we're here as part of York Environment Week 2022. Um, and our event series is sponsored by uh, the Postcode Lottery. Uh, I'm from Zero Carbon Yorkshire, and this event's being organised by, uh, by the, the organisation. And yeah, please, please join us, as I'll mention in the, in the uh, slides a bit later. Okay, so a quick introduction. So Zero Carbon Yorkshire, uh, as, as I said, is a charity and we exist to connect organisations and individuals to save carbon, uh, particularly in the Yorkshire region, although we are happy to help others. Uh, the main activities we, we're doing at the moment are monthly newsletters for our members uh, and organisations that have joined, uh, organising events, uh, mainly around the themes of buildings, food, transport, and more recently, energy. We are looking to add education to that as well. And one of the main things we're looking to do uh, as part of the postcode lottery bid uh, is to refresh our website and produce some case studies uh, that are useful for everybody. So all of this content will go onto our website um, to create a, a one-stop shop and signposting for everybody to find the resources they might find useful. Uh, just to quickly introduce myself, um, I am Luke Richardson. Um, I've assessed around 700 plus buildings um, at the last count. Um, I've surveyed schools, elderly persons' homes, um, depots, theme parks, um, and I'm also an ESOS lead assessor, which means I can assess energy assessments um, if you're into that kind of thing. So today's outcomes, uh, by the end of the event, I would like you to be able to uh, know about the price rises coming. Uh, we'll discuss that first. Uh, to be confident to do an initial energy audit of your building. Identify some of the key equipment that uses that energy. Have some tips to apply to your building. So I want it to be uh, quite discussional. We'll, I'll discuss out some ideas. Uh, we should be able to look for future improvements that you might be able to make. Um, and then also at the end, and then on our website, um, have some links and sources to start saving you some energy and possibly some money and carbon on the way as well. Um, so just for context for the energy price rises, I'm going to try not to get too political here, um, but uh, with the organisation I'm involved with, you can probably guess where I am. Um, so there are three... Uh, main areas of focus um, in energy, often referred to as the trilemma. They are energy security, um, affordability at the top there, energy finance, and environmental considerations. And these are all intertwined and affected by environmental law and policy, as this diagram nicely puts I've referenced the figure there. If you overemphasize one of them, um, it has impacts on the other. Uh, so when we're talking about energy security, um, the situation in the Ukraine, um, looking at if we allow fracking or not, uh, the impact of affordability on people's ability to heat or eat, uh, or fuel poverty, um, and then also we need to have a sustainable energy supply, so scaling those projects so they can actually replace fossil fuels. Overemphasis on any one of those will lead to problems in other areas. <clears throat> now, with the current situation, I do think there is an increased risk of environmental issues being sidelined and uh, because of this trilemma. Um, that's for discussion, um, but that's uh, where I think it is. So in terms of current support, uh, this is relatively new, uh, so bear with me, I've only had a, a day or two to process this. Um, the Prime Minister has announced some support, which will match the domestic rates as, as predicted. Um, so this is called the Energy Bill Relief Scheme um, for business, and this applies to organisations and uh, kind of community buildings as well. And this will apply for six months, starting the 1st of October to the 31st of March, where we're expecting a, a big uh, rise in wholesale cost as demand starts to ramp up. Um, and just for reference here, your megawatt is 1,000 kilowatts or a million watts. 
so uh, in the table there, you can see that the um, the wholesale price across the top has gone up a lot, <laughs> um, and the price cap uh, reduces that amount, which is um, paid by the consumer uh, through relief. Um, so that's the the impact of the help for business. I've left the link there, so you can click on and read if you'd like to. So uh, the this is the last I'll say on this one. Um, so the price rises. Um, these are the government's solutions to uh, the current energy crisis, if you want to call it that. Um, and I've colour coded it around our kind of organisation's view. Uh, I'm speaking from my own personal viewpoint. I'm not passes by the other uh, trustees yet, but um, clearly allowing another licensing round of North Sea oil and gas, uh, lifting the moratorium on fracking, you know, shale gas production. Are clearly not compatible with our current views on how things should be managed. Um, there is some good news in there, such as a drive forward of energy supply from other <laughs> uh, other companies. Um, however, they've included nuclear as well, which is potentially compatible, which is why it's kind of orangish, um, but maybe not uh, with kind of environmental concerns. Uh, we're going to keep progressing our nuclear program and also then look at reforms to the structure of the energy market. Um, this looks very uh, kind of inward looking and it's to be seen what that looks like, if it'll lead to equitable energy supply and affordable energy uh, for consumers, as long as be, as well as being sustainable, we'll, we'll see. Um, and then also um, there's going to be a review, um, how many of those have we seen uh, around uh, that 50, 2050 target in an economically efficient way, which I've highlighted, it's a big caveat and a potential red flag for me. And, and that's as political as I'm going to get today. We're going to get back to the, the buildings. I just think it's important to have that context considering where we are. Um, just to check, have we had any questions from that last section, Lucy, in the chat so far? If I hear nothing, I'll assume nothing, I can Nothing so far, but I'll keep an eye out. Yeah, if anyone's got any questions, do write them in the chat. Fantastic. So um, on that, I'll progress with the next section. Um, so the biggest contributors to your energy bill in a, a typical building, and in my experience, um, are the, the items there. So they're your heating, your heating system, your cooling system, your lighting, which is a bit of a notch down. Um, it's your heating and cooling, which is your main demand. Uh, specialised equipment. Um, so the examples I'm going to use through this are of a council office and uh, also a community bowls club. Now the bowls club has a massive water tank with a, a massive pump. And um, so that specialised equipment is the pump for irrigation of the bowls green, which needs to be maintained. And um, so that's what I mean by specialised equipment. It may be bespoke to your community building um, or it may be a piece of kit that you need for manufacture or, um, or to do a particular function. And then you've got your large appliances and small power. I'm not going to touch on them too much because uh, in an office uh, or community building setting, um, just turn them off. Um, and that's my uh, one of my one of my tips. So um, to run through the main tips of the presentation, and this is the one minute version, um, basically keep the heat or the cooled areas where they should be. Only use equipment when you have to, or switch it off, and use the most efficient device you can afford. Um, it'd be nice if everyone could have a Tesla, um, but not everyone can afford a Tesla. So why not get yourself a, a Prius or a, a slightly uh, less good option, but better than uh, a bog standard option? So what to what to look for? Um, this is the uh, me passing my knowledge on to you. Um, so the general principles, plan a walk around and look for what you have. And I'll help you go through that in the next few slides. Try and be positive as you do so, uh, particularly if you're interacting with uh, building users. Um, that could be another community group if they're hiring it. It could be employees if you have a few of those. So just try and be positive. Um, you're not there to tell them what they're doing wrong. You're looking for ways to save everyone money um, and help the environment. Um, we're also looking for waste and efficiency op opportunities. Um, so what we need to understand is what's not waste. Um, so people staying warm enough um, isn't waste. Um, and also 
using equipment as is safe to do so and as is required i.e., to make stuff or to do the function of the building or the organization you're in is not waste uh, you need to look for um is your equipment maintained it's, a, it's usually a good indicator of how how efficient things are um, and how well managed they are and then uh, i want you to be able to spot opportunities for new technology and also don't forget to ask your users what they think um some people are more vocal than others. Um, maybe ask those quieter ones who may have noticed something that you, you've missed. And then also, um, I have mixed views on looking at the energy data before or after assessment. If you look before, it tends to uh, focus you in on the areas that you think might be a problem, um, whereas you can be more objective if you don't look before. So an example, um, if I've looked at a school's energy data before I go to site and I can see there's a spike in elect um, electricity use in the summer, I'm probably going to go and look at the cooling system um, and see how that's being operated um, because of the uh, the main factors from the last, last slide. Um, whereas if I've not seen that, I'd maybe make more of an objective assessment and spend longer on other areas such as the heating system or the lighting system. So um, it, it can kind of um, skew your approach. Um, I'd recommend not looking, doing a first assessment to see what you've got, and then doing a more detailed dive once you have some data. And um, that would be my, my advice to you. So uh, whenever I'm doing an energy audit, um, I always start outside. Um, it helps me with my site plan if I'm doing one of those, um, but also so many features you can see and, and for me i can do an energy assessment uh, to about 70 80 percent just by walking around the outside of the building so you can see from the outside uh, what type of construction type you've got so you can see there's um there's just a, a classic brick wall there um you've also got um another brick type um with, with stone um and then on the kind of bottom left you have a non-traditional kind of concrete section build um, the solutions to make those efficient are different um, because they're different types. Um, if you're not confident on it, uh, do a bit of reading. Um, but also, if you've got such a big building, it's likely you've got some kind of support network to get drawings, get advice on what the best solution is for that type of building. Um, the principles are the same, though. Um, you're keeping the heat in where it needs to be heated. So you can either put insulation on the inside of the wall, internal, um, ex the external of the wall on the outside, or in the middle of the wall in, in terms of cavity. So in the top section, you can see there's some arrows pointing at the drill holes where this wall's had cavity wall insulation. And so these are the kind of clues you're looking for as you walk around your building. Now you can also see what roof type you've got. Um, not the best pictures, but the bottom right um, is a flat roof. So clearly we're not going to be looking at insulating a loft there. Um, however, we can install flat roof insulation, which would be a Kingspan board um, kind of over the top of the, the structure. So what openings can you see in the walls? Um, I refer to this as on-site, this is old. So if you've got a hole in your building, um, i.e. the main uh, outside material, um, you should make a note of that. So that could be a door, it could be a window. It could be just a hole there. <laughs> Why is that there? Make a note of it. Um, and in the bottom right, you can also see there's a vent. So you can see roughly where the plant equipment in this building is because you've walked around the outside and you've seen there's a, a big hole, there's a big vent. Um, well, what's there? Um, it usually means there's some equipment behind there, such as a boiler that needs ventilation, or it could be the in inlet for some kind of air handling. So it just gives you a clue where to look. Um, also, you can see what equipment's mounted outside the bottom left. You can see there's a, an air conditioning split unit um, just above the door there. Um, so you, you now know you've got cooling in that building. What's that serving? How's it controlled? Are the following questions? Um, and you can also see if there's been any work done before. So it'd be quite evident if there's been some external cladding put there. Um, but again, in the uh, top set, uh, kind of example, there's a drill holes where you can see there's been some cavity wall insulation. To follow on, I've, I've kind of alluded to this, but there is some equipment outside um, that you can just get big clues from. So in terms of cooling equipment on the bottom left, you can see there's some cooling equipment there. That's actually for a bar. Um, so 
is it free to vent? So what I mean by that is, um, is it unobstructed? Can the air be rejected quickly and get rid of the, the heat well? Um, if there's a, a big wall in front of it or it's in a corner, it probably isn't in the best location. Can we look at getting that moved? Um, what type of boiler do you have? You can see just from, from looking at the bottom one, bottom middle, that's a condensing boiler flue, uh, which means that you've got uh, quite an efficient boiler that can, is capable of doing hot water and heating, um, which is you know the modern standard uh, if you're on gas or oil. Um, and you've got special, specialist equipment at the top right, that's the big water tank, because when the bowl's green is getting irrigated, it needs a big supply of water. So that's given me a clue that well, there's a big piece of kit there doing something. Um, bottom right, uh, fuel type. Um, so the big oil tank in the garden gives away that it's probably on oil um, straight away. Um, so when you're on site, you can uh, look at the oil records or request the invoices from your uh, person who, who handles that um, and see what consumption you might be using. Um, just so you don't miss any fuel types when you're doing an assessment. So back to openings. So as I mentioned there, any hole in the building, you've probably seen these now from the outside if you followed uh, my advice. So there any gap in the main covering of the building. So for doors, we're looking at, can you see any daylight under, over in the middle? If they do, then you probably need some draft stripping. Um, so what you're trying to do is again, keep that heat in. So make sure you've covered those holes. Um, your windows, have a look around in the seals down the bottom right. Uh, you can see I've taken a picture down into the, between the glazed panes, you can see there's two panes. It may give you a year of install so you can work out how efficient it is. Uh, as a rule of thumb, if it's before 2002, it's probably getting a bit tired now um, and it's of a lower efficiency than post 2002 building regs. So um, you might want to look at getting those replaced um, or at least um, monitoring how, how effective they're being, ask, ask your users. Um, can they open them so you can get some free cooling and ventilation? Um, if they're painted shut, they probably can't. Um, a good clue. Um, and, and then also, uh, are they clean uh, to maximise that natural light? We don't like to see no one home and the lights on um, uh, as energy managers. Um, let's uh, make sure that they're, uh, they're off and then the windows are clean um, so we've got as much natural light as possible. Um, I mentioned the, the louver in the, in the last slide. Uh, Lisa, I don't know if you can mute the background noise there. Okay. Um, so if you've got any gaps or, or louvers, kind of openings with, with kind of grills over the top, uh, what equipment do you have there? And uh, go and have a look. Um, be curious. Um, it's your building or the, the building you care about. So let's go and find out. Um, and then in terms of minimizing gaps, you can see the bottom left, there is a draft lobby. So one set of doors is always shut, ideally, um, and that minimizes drafts and therefore heat loss out of that building. Um, however, if those automatic doors aren't uh, controlled properly, um, you're going to get losses anyway, um, because they're opening incorrectly or, or not. Right, next to the boiler house. Um, so this could be a separate room completely if you're in a big building. Um, it could be a cupboard. Um, and, and I'm thinking a cleaner's cupboard in this instance, or it could just be a cupboard or freestanding in the kitchen, like the top example there. So what fuel type is it? Well, if you've got gas pipes going in, it's likely that. Um, if, you've got, if you've seen the fuel tank outside, you can be pretty confident it's an oil boiler. But do have a look at that pipe work just to check. Um, the next thing to look at is when was it last serviced? Ask your building manager. Um, if you are the building manager, um, when do you last remember doing it? Ideally, it's done every year, um, mainly for safety concerns. Uh, but um, you know, go check those records. When was it last serviced? And if you're really lucky, uh, we'll come back to this in another slide. Uh, they may put on an efficiency rating for you, so you can see uh, what kind of improvements you might be able to get. Um, also, if you've got an air handling system, um, cleaning of the filters is absolutely uh, paramount. Um, you're not going to get the efficiency started with. Um, a good analogy uh, potentially is, is a hoover. 
Um, if you haven't cleaned your, your bag, uh, haven't emptied it, then you're not going to get the same suction. You're not going to get the same power to uh, to absorb that dust. It's the same with filters in an air handling system and in your building. If it's full of dirt, um, it's not going to work as well as it did before. Um, so it's going to use more energy or be less effective. What controls are available? So have a look around the room. You should be looking for sensors for uh, time, temperature. And then I mentioned assisted there. So if you've got a big building, it's likely to have some kind of uh, complex control, which will have some kind of weather optimization. So it'll plan um, in its programming uh, when to turn on to meet, re meet the target temperature um, or some kind of weather compensation. So um, it will just make sure that it's matching um, the occupancy and the temperature settings that you've put into the system. Uh, and this brings me on to my next point. Do people know how it works? Um, ask people, um, let them show you how it works. And then uh, if you can do it yourself as well, that's even better because um, you know that they knew what they were teaching you. Um, so a uh, quick word on insulation, uh, particularly in the boiler house or around your boiler. Um, so water's at its hottest here. And um, so that temperature gradient is at its highest. So it's got the highest heat loss potential and just to be negative about it. So insulate your pipes and just, just insulate them and go down to B&Q, get some, uh, some insulation and insulate them. Um, if you've got bigger systems, um, you can also insulate your valves, your flanges, heat exchanges, um, and there's the custom wraps to get those done. And they're quite common now. The payback's usually within three months. So just, just get them bought. Um, this is a, a real quick win um, if you've got a, a larger system. Uh, a good kind of test if you're just walking into your boiler house for the first time um, is are you warm in there? Um, ideally, you shouldn't be warm <laughs> because it's supposed to be pushing that energy into the building, not into the plant room. So controls and sensors, um, there's so many, I've had to put, make a few slides, so apologies for that. So um, controls are your best way to save money, energy and carbon today because they're already in your building and you can set them differently to use more or less energy. There's many different shapes and sizes and I've got a couple of slides uh, after this and you can't really be an expert at all of them. Um, I've tried, I've learned to program a few and then they introduce a new one um, it works slightly differently and you start again. So a building energy management system, uh, highly technical and adapt to the building uh, with many sensors and inputs. I, I kind of alluded to this in the last slide, um, but they can also control other things as well as the heating, which is quite confusing. So you could potentially have your, uh, your gas interlock on your kitchen ventilation system, for example, on this. Uh, you could have your doors um, also controlled by your building management system. So it's not just energy, but classically, um, from, from my experience, they're only used for energy, um, not boiler and cooling control. Um, boiler controls are often set or reset um, by service engineers when you've had your service or reset when you've had a power outage. Um, this is another reason to just get comfortable with it because if your control falls over, um, what are you going to do next? Um, if you can control it and uh, and program it yourself, then, then great. Uh, if not, you're going to have to call someone out to, to help. All right, I'll go back to default settings, which may be constant on or on all day, even on weekends when your building isn't being used. Um, so uh, just check that those uh, controls are right uh, and make sure you're comfortable with them. So more local controls. Um, these can be remote or they can be attached to the wall. Um, and they can be per room or they can be per zone or could be for the whole building if it's a smaller building. So on the right hand side, I've got a, uh, an air conditioning control, but this is uh, heating and cooling. Um, it's set to 29. I wouldn't advise anyone set it to 29. Um, avoid heating above 19 or cooling below 24 because that's a dead band. It's room temperature. So you shouldn't be cooling below that. You shouldn't be heating above that um, because it's just wasting energy. It's uh, not kind of hitting my golden rule of, of not wasting uh, wasting energy. Um, if you're not in the building, uh, turn it off. 
um, simple as that. Um, the only thing to be mindful of is in winter, um, there's usually a frost protection setting. Um, so if you completely isolate it and don't leave the frost protection on, you could get a burst pipe. So you just need to be mindful of that. If you are turning things off um, completely, um, ideally you'd leave it in frost protection mode and it will kick in um, if it drops to those kind of near frost conditions uh, and save any pipe bursts and, and leaks you may get off the back of that. Um, at the bottom right hand corner has a thermostatic radiator valve on it. It's one of those twisty things you might have at home. So um, just set those to comfort um, and try and uh, engage your users to say, well, we know that a three is, is good enough. Um, you can actually remove them once you've set them as well, um, if you get uh, good ones. So uh, uh, if you're having problems with your building users tweaking things that shouldn't be, um, you can potentially remove those once you've set them. Uh, just to run through a few more controls, we talked about the thermostatic radiator valve top left, um, your air conditioning and heating control in the middle, um, light banks and switching. Um, it's it, This is a quick win. Uh, get those labelled. What's the top right one doing? Who knows? Is it controlling a fan? Is it controlling a light? Um, is it uh, doing external lighting? L label your switches and let, let people know what they're doing. Um, Otherwise, people walk into a room and turn them all on. Um, come back to that later. And the bottom left, um, in your kind of distribution board, you call it your fuse board at home, you'll sometimes have timer switches. And just look out for those because they're sometimes really helpful, uh, particularly for external lighting. Um, really quick, efficient measure. Um, the device just sits in the, in the fuse board and can isolate um, instantaneously uh, on time or um, if certain uh, parameters are met. Uh, bottom middle is a sensor cover, uh, usually for a, a temperature sensor, and that would be part of a bigger, more complex system. If you take the cover off, um, it just looks like a, like a resistor you would have looked at in science or electronics at school. Um, bottom right is your classic um, kind of older boiler control uh, with time and temperature. Um, and these are the ones where if you have a quick look at the model, uh, give it a Google, um, have a look through that manual, see if it makes sense. Um, I would say uh, let us know at Zero Carbon Yorkshire if, you, uh, if you're struggling to find the right model, send me a picture and I'll try and help. Uh, hot water. Uh, so if you have a condensing boiler, uh, like the two examples before, um, it's likely that your hot water is achieved through being a combination boiler, so it does heating and hot water. So you may not have a water tank, um, but you may have some of these point of use devices down the bottom right. If you have a tank, though, um, it's likely for three reasons. The first one is you've got an older system um, where you have tank fed water. Uh, and the, the general advice is just get that insulated as much as possible. Um, or obviously replace with a combi if you have the means or your boiler's failed. Um, a new pre-coated one in the factory is, is so much better than putting a wrap around it. So if you can afford a new tank and you intend to keep, keep a tank in, in your, your building, um, then uh, you know ideally buy one factory done um, because it's up to good standards straight away. Um, and you don't have the issues with uh, poor installation or often missing the bottom of the tank. Um, so if you uh, you may have a high water demand, which is why you have a tank. So uh, this, a good example of this is when you've got lots of showers, um, you may need, you know, you may have a lot of people leaving a, a, a leisure centre kind of equivalent to a community hall after the exercise and you might have showers and then everyone's using the showers at once. So you need that tank to have that resilience. If you do have that, um, the advice above stands, but also um, to paraphrase Tony Blair, insulate, insulate, insulate. Um, make sure you've insulated all your pipes, flanges, valves, tanks, insulate everything. Um, and then the third option, uh, or for third main reason you'd have a tank is that you've got some kind of solar panels. You may have solar thermal, which um, create hot water. Or you may have photovoltaic, which generate electricity um, with the excess electricity. Um, dumping um, energy into your water tank. It just adds an efficiency to that project. If you've got that, it's likely to be a good standard because they're relatively new to the market. 
Um, but those principles of just keeping the heat in the tank where it's supposed to be is, uh, it still stands. Um, so point of use heaters, um, these can be great for kind of smaller occasional use. So if you've got a community building where you just got a bit of hand washing um, and it's only occasionally used, these can be a really good, a good solution. Usually electric, um, in fact, yeah, I think all the ones I've seen um, have been electric certainly recently. Um, you can have a, a larger site with a small demand. So in, in schools, for example, uh, you'll have um, kind of small classrooms uh, right around the outs outskirts of the, the site when the, the school's grown. And instead of piping from the main boiler, um, they'll just put one of these in. Um, so the hot water demand can be met for the toilets and hand washing. Um, whereas, yeah, and it doesn't affect the main system um, and it's not tracking across the playground where it's losing all the, the heat. Uh, it does need to be balanced against uh, the additional maintenance uh, costs as well. Um, it's likely you'll need to do kind of Legionella testing um, and it will cost you uh, for an immersion heater for all the time it's operating. So um, this one to consider. Uh, lighting. So maximize your natural light. I mentioned window cleaning. Um, and uh, natural light is free, which is always good. Um, so uh, clean your windows and skylights. Um, default to keep your lights off. Um, and it, the way I, I like phrasing this rather than switch it off is keep your lights off. Just turn them on when you need them. And the, the default seems to be um, you walk into the building and, and everything's turned on. Um, try and change that default. Let's keep them off. Um, so train your building users on how to open up and close down, write those guides, label your switching, um, and then just make it that, that habit that lights only go on when they're absolutely needed. Uh, keep them working, so report faults and replace um, lights with the most efficient fitting, uh, efficient device for the fitting. So uh, I will come back to that a little later uh, in reference to compact fluorescent lighting. Um, but now it's upgrade to LED. They're relatively relatively cheap um, compared to where they were a few years ago, uh, and they will save you money in the longer term. Uh, and these are about 5% of the energy of a, a conventional bulb. So it's really a, a, an easy decision these days. Um, main advice on that is to use a reputable contractor um, because you, what you want is, is good output um, appropriate to your building use. So in the bottom example, um, that's a, a council chamber. Um, using spotlights, which are dimmable, um, but are very old, inefficient lighting. Um, it's spot lighting when ideally it should be just general lighting uh, to illuminate the room when it's being used. Uh, but um, th there it is. Um, that's what we've got. That's what was installed. And uh, it needs to move with the times, really, and, and get some more efficient lighting in there. Uh, meters. So... This is a this is a real <laughs> bit of contention for me. Uh, so metering is great. I love love metering. Gives me lots of data. Um, but finding them and knowing how to read them is is not great. It's um it's a real minefield. Uh, get to know where your meters are. Uh, they're often in uh, cupboards on the side of your building in smaller buildings. If you've got a larger site, it's probably going to be in a, an enclosure somewhere at the entrance or on the field of your site. Uh, upgrade to smart meters if you can. Um, you can't always have a smart meter. Uh, gas has only recently started to uh, kind of work well um, and usually involves some kind of battery uh, because there's no power at the point of the gas supply. So um, having a smart meter is, is difficult or uh, more difficult than it could be. Uh, water meters are a completely different animal. Um, and again, they don't usually have power supplies near where they are. So it just do it if you can. If you have a, a high demand, uh, more than 100 kilowatts, um, you will likely have data for your site already, but your supplier owns it. So you need to ask or access it through their website. Uh, get in touch with them, ask them if you can have it, uh, or ask them if you can have a login to, to see it. Um, it just helps greatly with spotting issues early. So if, if you're regularly looking at your data, or ideally you can set some kind of warning that actually this consumption has got loads and um, you're going to get a, an email and you don't have to um well then you can go investigate what it is um, and find out and try and help 
So in terms of meters, um, I've just put an array of different ones here. There's, there's so many more. Um, but these are kind of typical of what you might find in and around. Um, top left is a water meter. Um, it's buried under the ground. Um, they're, they're difficult to, to read. Um, sometimes they have coverings that you need special tools to access. Um, try and work out how you can get access to that so you can see what you, what, how you can get that information. Um, but ideally, <clears throat> challenge your water supply to make it smart. Uh, gas, um, there's a, a classic gas meter. Um, you can tell by its features. Top left is a governor, which means it's some kind of like got some kind of pressure regulation on it, which means it's a gas meter. Um, and that does have a logger on it. You can see plugged into the bottom right of the where the red, red dials are highlighted. So that means that that's got some kind of data logging that you'll be able to find the data from. Uh, the next one over, the three in a row, that's one meter per electrical phase. Um, really difficult to read with the dial meters. These are being phased out, but there's still some around. So if you see that kind of thing, that's electricity. Uh, top right is a gas meter. Um, it's a rotary gas meter, again, very old, um, but there's still plenty of these around as well. Um, ideally, we'd make those, those smart with a, a logger or, or get a new, a new smart meter installed. The bottom three are all uh, are all electrical meters. Um, the bottom left is just a one phase meter. The middle one is a polyphase, which means it can do bigger supplies and um, have three phases going into it. Uh, and the same with the bottom right, um, although it does have a low rate, which is usually for storage heating or night rate, as some people call it, and a day rate on the right or normal rate um, with an LED to indicate which one it's on. So if you've got storage heating or something um, that's charging up overnight, um, you may have this type of meter where you have a low or a night rate and a day rate as well. Okay, we're on to the improvement section. So I'll just uh, check in if we've had any questions as we've gone through. Yeah, we've got a, chest, a question in the chat from Phil. Do you want me to read it or you? <laughs> yeah, could you read it? Uh, it's okay, Lucy, thank you. If a business doesn't have half hourly data, would you suggest uh, using smart plugs to monitor the energy consumption of an individual appliance to generate basic consumption data? Uh, yes, um, absolutely. Any data you can get is is great because um, then you can you can use it to educate your users how much that's you like using, um, how much you could potentially save. Or it might help you justify a, a business case to change that device. Um, if you're not a half hourly supply, you can still get smart meters. And the best place to check is your supplier. They, they have a mandate to roll smart meter out as much as possible. Um, so it's likely um, that you'll be able to get that for free. Um, and then just ask them how you can then access that data. Um, uh, in terms of portable monitoring, it, it can be really useful. Um, I, I did um, an ESOS assessment on a theme park and I had to use a portable logger or a clamp meter, it's called, um, kind of colloquially, uh, to log all the rides um, for a, a period of time, calculate the usage um, and create an energy report off the back of that. So yeah, clamp meters or portable meters that you can move around can be really useful if you've got unmetered um, devices, particularly like specialist equipment um, in and around your, your kind of building. Uh, if you do have a logger that literally plugs into a plug socket, yeah, be curious, plug it into your photocopier um, and your small power items and see, you know, what's it doing and how can you potentially make it better and test it one week one way and another week the other and see what kind of savings you might be able to get. Um, was there any more questions, Lucy? And uh, nope, that's it for now. But do Excellent. continue to write questions in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Um, so we'll move on to the improvements. Um, so we've now completed our walk around survey, try to impart my brain. Um, this, um, this event will be hosted on, on the Zero Carbon Yorkshire website. So uh, on, and on the YouTube channel. So if, if you need to revisit anything or you're going to plan another one, please do come back and, and have, a, have a look. Um, so improvements uh, you're free to do. Um, so complete that walk around. 
and, and also built one in for summer. Um, the the kind of demand uh, for heating, cooling changes from season to season. Um, so just do a couple and see, see what you find. Um, you may find that uh, you know you're doing really well with your heating management, but actually the, the aircon's always on in summer. Um, is there something you can do there? Uh, check when the equipment was last maintained. Um, the bottom right is um, I mentioned earlier. So this has had a full service um, and even helpfully they've put an efficiency of the system um, on the bottom right. This must have been at the request of the client. Um, but you can see that it's 88% uh, efficient, which is not bad. Um, oil boilers tend to be more efficient than gas boilers, um, but you've got to measure, uh, kind of balance that against the carbon intensity of the, the different fuel. Um, appoint a champion um, to report anything that's not working. And so if the lights are out, um, if there's something being noisy, like a piece of equipment, it might be struggling to work properly, um, flag that up and then get it fixed because it's going to use more energy whilst it's creating that noise or, or while it's really dirty. Um, so just uh, get it reported. Um, if you haven't got an energy champion, it may be you for now. Um, before you can hand that over again. But uh, do try and appoint a champion, a regular user who can just keep those reports coming in. Oh, this isn't quite working properly. Can we have a look at it, please? Um, and again, label your, your plugs and switches. What are they doing? Uh, I do like the switch it off logo, like the logos from the Carbon Trust. I think they've stopped giving out those stickers now, but um, if, if I do find uh, a source, I'll, I'll put it on the website. Um, but um, ideally, um, yeah, switch it off is great for a plug, but uh, lighting, yeah, what's it doing as well? Um, read your equipment manuals, be curious. What have you got? Google the, the brand and the model, and you'll likely find a manual um, saying how to use it. Um, my trick is usually just to go when the servicing guys go and ask them lots of questions. And they're usually quite happy to have a bit of company, especially if you bring them a cup of tea. And so just um, ask them what they know how best to operate it and maybe tell them what kind of programs you want if you're not confident. And um, so, you know, that's set right at least once a year. Um, if you do get confident, um, ideally you'd make changes to your controls every season and um, to make sure that it's reflecting the temperature and, and condition. Uh, yeah, tweet your controls to closed doors, like on that draft lobby I mentioned earlier, um, or change temperatures um, according to what you've currently got. And use, that, use your supplier's website to track usage over time. A lot of these we've covered already, but this is a reminder, really. And so small investments. Um, so uh, repair your openings. Remember, those are gaps in the kind of continuous construction. And um, so if you've got a, a window that's not shutting properly, um, if it's not sealed properly, um, if you've got a door that's not currently like fully sealed, it's not closing properly. If you've got any gaps, fill them. Um, this repair your openings, you're trying to keep heat where it needs to be or keep the cool where it's supposed to be. Um, wash your windows and your skylights. Um, I've put this in small cost because it still costs money to clean your windows unless you're up there yourself. Um, and uh, obviously there's some safety implications of cleaning your skylights on your own. So ideally you need a specialist contractor, hence a bit of, bit of cost. Um, but then at least you're getting as much natural light as you can. Um, apply draft exclusion measures. They may be little seals or um, even just uh, at home projects to put under your door to stop the drafts coming in and losing heat out the building. Um, a little bit more investment, but um, add controls to your different lighting areas. So if you've got a main hall that you rent out, um, control it differently to the rest of the building. Does it need to be on when the rest of the building's being used? Um, can users come in and just use those lights? That's ideally what would happen. So they're only using what they need. So we're just not wasting, as we said earlier. Um, add insulation to your loft um, or um, in the kind of larger investments. Um, if you've got a flat roof, you can add it to your roof too. It's quite a big area for heat loss. Um, if you don't insulate properly there. And then change light bulbs or fittings to higher efficiency ones. Um, the diagram on the top right, um, a T12 is a top. Um, it's um, 12 eighths of an inch. Your T8 is one inch or eight eighths of an inch. And your T5 is five eighths of an inch. Now, if you've got the old T12 type, you can put a T8 in there with no changes needed. 
if you want to put a T5 in, um, then you will need a change of fitting. Um, at this point, I would say skip the T5 and go straight to LED. Um, there's no point upgrading to T5s at this point. Um, LEDs are so much more efficient that you will make, get your payback within a, a couple of years. So um, I've got one more question, sorry. There's another question in the chat about um, drafts. Um, I've seen the plastic curtains, the style of the walk-in freezers style um, on external doors, mainly schools. Would you recommend them? Yes, and I have recommended them. Um, yeah, uh, when I was surveying schools, uh, I'd always recommend them, particularly with the uh, free flow policy, it's called. And um, so the DFT instructed that all uh, children under under seven, I think it was, had access to outdoor play space all, at all times of year. And um, so the, the kind of butcher curtains, as they're known, um, are really helpful just to stop the draft going out. They're not perfect, um, but they, they do a job. Uh, the other thing uh, that, that was really uh, useful, and this wasn't something I came up with myself, it was a school that just had the innovation, um, is the, the big uh, kind of door stopping uh, foam wedges. So you kind of clip them over they're like a, a big foam staple uh, and they allow you to keep the door open, um, um, but also protects fingers um, and this allows the children to free flow out the door, which is the intention of that legislation. Um, so yes, any anything you can do like that is is definitely a, a good a good move. Um, not the most glamorous, not the most the best looking solution, but, um, but it does do do a job. Okay. Um, okay, we'll move on to the larger investments. Um, so cavity wall insulation. Uh, we mentioned that earlier with the brickwork and the drill holes. Um, it's quite an established kind of technology now and improvement. It'll give you a payback within three to seven years that kind of range. So it's, it's worth a look at if, you, uh, if you've got quite a big uh, expanse of brickwork um, with a cavity. Uh, window and glazing improvements. So this is a massive investment potentially depending on your, your, mi your mix of um, uh, glass to main construction material. Um, but um, it's a, quite a big contributor to your heat loss as well. So 30% um, of your bill is roughly free windows. Um, so oh, that's your heating load, sorry. So do have a look at that. Uh, and then full lighting replacement. So if you're not just changing bulbs and you're looking to replace every light in your building, um, that can become quite a high cost measure. But if you're reducing it, your consumption by 95%, if you're moving from a T12 to an LED, it's probably worth it. Uh, so non-traditional walls and floor insulation. So in that first example with the concrete sections, it's quite difficult to insulate those. Um, and also under floors, it's quite difficult and disruptive. So I would recommend doing those if you're doing refurbishments only, um, because it likely won't pay back for over seven years. <clears throat> now heating system changes. I just want to mention the, the boiler upgrade scheme. There's currently uh, five thousand pound support to install an air source heat pump and that runs to april 25 and the vat is also zero on heat pumps at the moment so um if you if you're looking to change your boiler you may want to consider a heat pump and while this supports in place in the next couple of years um it's usually quite a disruptive thing um with a heat pump um because you need to make some changes to your heating system as well but um, you're likely to get three units of power where you only had one before on 88% in that boiler example. Um, so just to kind of make that a bit clearer, for every one unit you put in with a conventional boiler, you get 0.9 out. Um, with a heat pump, you put one unit in and you get three units out. So that's where you get your efficiency from. Um, so renewables, um, I wanted to mention them. Um, Basically, do everything else before this first, um, is my advice, because we don't want to just be greenwashing. Uh, we don't want to be just putting eco bling on our buildings. We want to make genuine improvements. Um, but that said, um, keep aware of funding opportunities. If you get a chance to put solar panels on your, your roof um, and it's affordable for you, yeah, let's do it. Um, help you generate some energy, save some carbon, um, and that's what we're here for. Um, renewables are a classic horses for courses situation. So 
in the bowls club example on the top we've got a south facing roof with a pitch roof great solar is great for that um if you've got a good amount of land like the council office down the bottom right ground source heat pump um got lots of land to potentially run pipe work um but do engage with experts and look for future funding there may be some community energy schemes you can support and i'd encourage you to support them you might be able to get better value with others um, and then lastly um here's some resources that might be able to help you we are going to upgrade our website as we mentioned on the first slide um with with more of this but here are some links for you straight, straight away i will add to this before the uh, before it's submitted to the website just to help and over to any final questions. We've got a question from Phil. Um, as an option to ASHPs, uh, what, what would your thoughts be on combined heat and power systems from 3KW for small businesses? Yeah, so, so yeah, air source heat pumps, um, they, they're really good because um, they can just be put freestanding on a roof where they can just be put and forgotten about and um, left alone until they need to be serviced. Um, and I think that's the future um, because you're getting, again, three plus units out per one in. Um, a CHP, you need a high heat demand. Um, so I tended to recommend uh, combined heat and power um, when you've got a heat sink such as a swimming pool uh, where you can just dump heat in constantly. Uh, in essence, what you're doing with a combined heat and power plant is you're creating electricity on site and using the waste heat from that process to heat your building or to heat your swimming pool. So where you do have a high heat demand, it really it does work well. Um, we don't, it tends to be um, a bit of a kind of a vanity project um, unfortunately, um, and I've seen so many switched off um, in smaller installations where they just haven't got the heat demand to make it work. Uh, engage with experts, but the the rule of thumb with CHP is uh, you you kind of size it for your base load. So when you've got your minimum energy use, is it enough to sustain uh, a, a three kilowatt combined heating power? Uh, if it isn't. Um, then you probably have a better solution somewhere else. I, th I think that answers your question, but it might not be a popular answer. Um, okay, we've got another one. Uh, it says, great, great explanation of CHP, thanks. Um, for the last few years, schools have had their windows open in the middle of winter for COVID. Any guidance or ideas on how to give them the confidence not to do this in the winter? Yeah, this is a this is a real problem at the moment um, in terms of uh, energy management one hundred and one. Um, so the, the the best solution really is. Um, is, is to introduce some kind of um, air handling within your building for air exchange rates that can be controlled a bit better. Um, this is really expensive though. So um, there's been some recent uh, changes to building regulations where you need to have, uh, you have target um, ventilation rates and target uh, kind of particulates uh, allowed in a building. Um, so just to give you a bit more of a digestible answer, um, uh, where you have uh, kind of CO2, um, so carbon monoxide monitoring, sorry. Uh, you, you have a target rate, so you can't exceed a certain amount now under the current building regulations. Uh, and the only way to address that is to introduce ventilation um, or air change rates. Um, that's either done by opening windows, as you've mentioned, or uh, you can install some kind of kit to do so. Um, so it's mechanical ventilation, unfortunately. Um, the only other thing you can do is look at uh, what are called trickle vents above windows. Um, so that allows some air in um, at a rate uh, and see if that meets the targets that you're looking for. Um, it's not an easy one to fix this, um, but where you can use natural ventilation, um, 
and not mechanical ventilation you're going to save energy um, and where you can't um if, if you if you must use mechanical ventilation you should probably look at a, a central system um, that also does the heating because actually having one system you can control with different zones may actually be more efficient than your current heating system um especially if you're leaving your windows open and losing all your heat anyway um, so um, my advice would be to look at some options and um, can you open your trickle vents and and still deliver good air change rates or do you need to look at something a bit more involved in terms of a, um, some kind of air handling um, and your air handling could then do your heating which could be fed by an air source heat pump or a combined heat and power plant with biomass or something like that but that's getting much more technical than probably need to today. Was there any more, Lucy? Um, there's no more questions, but someone said a very useful and informative session. And I think we're just just coming up to time anyway, so very <laughs> well timed. <laughs> um, if, if there, <clears throat> if you have any questions, though, you can always email. Um, you'll have everyone will have had an email from me, so um, do do let me know. Excellent. Well. On that basis, I will uh, let Lucy close the session. Uh, thanks for all attending this morning. Uh, if you missed anything,